I'll start this episode with a quick disclaimer. I'm not a historian, and I'm not a theologian. I'm just a guy who likes history. And here in the American Midwest, St. Patrick's Day has always been one of the weirder holidays to me. It comes off as sort of a negative stereotype drunk Irish Catholic day. But pretty much everyone's happy about it. And even if you're not Catholic, or heck, Christian at all for that matter, you're supposed to decorate with the color green. Especially shamrocks. And you need to wear green or you'll get pinched. And you probably ought to have some green beer as you watch college basketball. That's just what we do. And in many, if not most places, there will also be some sort of parade downtown with a the theme of St. Patty's Day and some Celtic music. It might be one of the best examples of cultural Christianity that you could observe. Because as I already mentioned once, you don't need to be Irish or Catholic or Orthodox or even Christian at all to be influenced by the day in some capacity. Which is strange, really, because most of the Protestant churches, which make up most churches in America, don't generally recognize saints, if at all, and at least nothing like the way the Catholic Church does. And aside from a few places around the country, there's probably not a lot of real, genuine Irish accents floating around. So what's the deal? Who was Patrick? What's he got to do with shamrocks, green beer, Ireland, and Christianity? The legends most people, including myself, are probably familiar with, in short form, go something like this. Patrick had climbed to the top of a hill and fasted for 40 days. A mass of snakes had gathered near the mount and were threatening and menacing Patrick. At the end of the 40 days, Patrick came down from the hill, and along with his iconic staff, he chased all the snakes out to the Irish Sea where they drowned, and afterwards there were no more snakes in Ireland. About the same time this story appeared, we also get the first appearance of the now famous Shamrock. Patrick supposedly used the Shamrock while preaching to some Celtic tribesmen. The three leaves were used to demonstrate the three-in-one nature of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as three separate but unified entities. In another story, a Celtic warrior falls in love with a Celtic goddess. He lives with her in a land of eternal youth. After a few centuries, though, he gets homesick. But the goddess only lets him leave under the condition that he never set foot in Ireland. Having to remain on horseback, he returns to Ireland. And he's even more depressed once he gets there, because everyone he knew and loved was gone. He ends up leaving his horse to help a man push a stone, and when he touches the ground, he starts aging rapidly. It just so happens that Patrick is walking by about the same time, and then they start debating whose faith is more true, as the Celt slowly withers away and dies. The cross Patrick is usually seen with, either a cross with a circle or a circle around the center of a cross, is also said to be an attempt by Patrick to influence the Celts by using symbols that they liked, such as the circle, alongside the symbol of the cross. But as with a lot of stories from that time period, what's fact and what's myth? The stories above are, of course, the myth or legend of St. Patrick, but they're very rich in symbolism. For example, Patrick's 40 days on the mountain mirrors Jesus' 40 days in the desert that culminate in his temptation by Satan. Patrick's story, of course, ending with the snakes, which is, of course, one of Satan's forms. The snakes are doing double duty in this story, too, likely representing the Celtic Druid priests that ultimately disappeared from the island. Really, you could even tie this into the symbology of St. George and the dragon, too, which might be more relevant to this story than you think, given the time that Patrick actually lived. But the reason there are no snakes in Ireland probably has more to do with the fact that Ireland was once mostly a frozen glacier, and when the glacier left, it became an island, a cold, wet island, and snakes just never really had a chance to move in unless someone brought them over in a box. The shamrock, of course, is probably the most iconic symbol of St. Paddy's Day, and of course one of Irish culture in general. So where do we get that from, and what's it got to do with Patrick? In 1681, over 1200 years after the life of Patrick, a man named Thomas Dinnelly wrote that the shamrock was adopted as a custom by some Irish people and worn as a sort of badge of pride in remembrance of Patrick on a day in early spring. He even goes on to note the party atmosphere and drunkenness on that day as well, which involved putting the shamrock in the beer or whiskey and drinking it. But the first written record of Patrick actually using the shamrock as a teaching tool doesn't appear until 40 years later, well into the 1700s. Though, if people were actively associating with the shamrock with Patrick, it might not be too far-fetched to think that it actually happened. After all, Easter eggs are a Christian tradition too, but they have nothing to do with the Bible. But we'll tackle that in some other episode. 
The story of Patrick and the aging Celtic man married to a goddess also doesn't appear until well after Patrick's time, and it's a pretty straightforward display of the old Celtic pagans dying off in the face of Christianity. And the story of the cross, well, is just plain inaccurate. The Celts had crosses of their own, well before the Christian cross even, and they used them all the time, so a cross is not complicated or an innovative symbol. So who was this guy? What's with all the stories, and how did St. Patrick's Day become something of an Irish Heritage Day somewhat akin to the American Fourth of July? Strange indeed. And did I mention that Patrick wasn't even Irish? Well, it turns out, Patrick's real story isn't all that hard to find. Not to say that there's no missing details, but we still have some stuff attributed to the guy and a couple of letters. One of them is a book that he wrote about himself called Confession, or if you look for it today, you'll find it under Confessions of St. Patrick, translated from Latin. Latin, of course, was the educated and official language of the Roman Empire in Britain, where Patrick was born. This book is sort of an autobiography or a memoir of sorts, and there's a handful of great, more modern interpretations of his story as well that fill out a lot of the cultural details surrounding the time and place that Patrick lived. One of my favorites was St. Patrick of Ireland by Philip Freeman. The whole context thing is incredibly important. I think especially when we look at guys whose legends are so far removed from the time that the person themselves existed. And the church occupied a very different place in the world by the time those legends came around. St. Patrick's tomb is still around too, you can visit it, and some relics that were supposedly removed from his tomb at some point in antiquity are still on display, including a tooth from St. Patrick that's encased in some kind of shrine. So as I mentioned earlier, Patrick wasn't even Irish. Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't, but I didn't. It was a surprise to me. He was actually born in Britain, which was then part of the Roman Empire, and he was born into a noble family, around the year 386 AD. His father, Calpernicus, was a Roman decurion and a deacon in the church, very much a Roman citizen. In fact, given his noble status, it's possible that Patrick's father even took part in some earlier Roman campaigns against the tribes in Britain, including ones of Irish origin. We're also barely, if even a single generation, removed from Constantine the Great, proclaiming tolerance of Christianity in the Roman Empire. The Bible was also still fairly new as a formal compilation, and books and information didn't proliferate like they did today, so we're very much still in an oral message-dominated landscape. And in this landscape, there's also loads of prominent religions throughout the world, and perhaps especially in Britain even. You still have a lot of Roman religion, the Celtic religions are in full force, and possibly even things like Mithraism and whatever else might have been crawling around at the time. Rome was in a state of civil war. About this time, Magnus Maximus would kill Gratian and take control of the Western Empire. In the backdrop of all the political upheaval is religious upheaval as well, with Christians and pagans taking turns having the upper hand and blaming the other group for all the problems of society. This sort of turmoil, along with many other long-running problems, would eventually lead to the fall of the Roman Empire altogether. This was very far from a peaceful time, and far from what we see today, where just one or maybe two religions will dominate any given area. Patrick grew up in a Roman Christian household, and we don't know a lot about his childhood other than he was born into a noble family, which means he probably didn't have to do a lot of hard physical work, he would have been educated to a degree, but for the most part, it seems like he was a pretty standard teenager. He wasn't even really sure what he believed, and he didn't really seem to care so much for the religion of his parents. When he was 16, Patrick was kidnapped in a raid carried out by Celtic tribesmen, a really common thing in Britain at the time. The raiders would have met back at their boats and quickly decided amongst themselves, out of all the captured people, who was worth taking home as a slave and who wasn't. And if you didn't make the cut, you were most likely killed on the spot. Patrick luckily made the cut. Patrick was taken across the sea to Ireland and enslaved as a shepherd. We tend to romanticize or understate shepherding to some degree. You have to consider that at the time, this was one of, if not the lowest job you could be given. In Judaism, these people were ceremoniously unclean, and in Ireland, sheep were the B-team livestock, and cattle were what prestigious and wealthy people did. Even amongst slaves, field workers were lower than the house workers, so this must have been especially shocking to Patrick who was born into a noble Roman family. And slavery in Ireland was not like slavery in Rome at the time, where you might actually have a chance to buy or earn your freedom from your master. Patrick soon hit rock bottom, in a foreign land doing hard work 
and surrounded by a language and customs he didn't understand. In time, Patrick's understanding of the Celts grew, though, and he came to appreciate the religion and God of his father. The stories and prayers he learned as a kid became his encouragement. Patrick prayed regularly and would even begin fasting at times. Both of these must have been strange to his captors. Prayer was typically out loud, but the fasting was probably especially weird. In the Judeo-Christian world, fasting was a means and is a means of self-sacrifice. But in Ireland at the time, fasting was something you did on your neighbor's doorstep to make the town aware that they had done something to offend you. You didn't fast to honor God, you fasted to let everyone else know that somebody else screwed up. Then one night, Patrick heard a voice while he slept. It told him he would be going home soon, after around six years of slavery. The next night, the voice returned and told Patrick where to go. The problem, though, was that the place was about 200 miles away, and Patrick didn't have much of anything in the way of supplies to take with him. Patrick did manage to escape, though, and he eventually made it to the harbor. But he had a hard time joining a crew as an escaped slave who was now gaunt from a trek across Ireland. The first captain he approached flatly told him no, but later the same day, the captain changed his mind and Patrick set sail. Patrick eventually made it home, and his family was elated. I can't help but wonder how mobbed Patrick might have felt, the returned son of a local nobleman after years amongst the savages. But he was a different Patrick now, which really isn't all that uncommon. PTSD or whatever you want to call it, most people don't come back from traumatic events like that quite the same. He wasn't the rich kid from before, content to just fill the noble role and inherit his dad's wealth and status. To top it off, by the time Patrick returned to Britain, Britain was no longer in the Roman Empire. The world Patrick returned to was starting to be as different as he was. Patrick then had another dream. He spoke to a man named Victorus, who handed him a scroll called The Voice of the Irish, and the scroll spoke to him, even mocked him, and called him back to Ireland. I wonder how Patrick felt about that. On the one hand, it's going back to a place where you were at the lowest of the low and a beaten slave, scooping poop out of a stall in between bouts of freezing rain. On the other hand, once you've had that kind of experiential high, how do you go back to the boring everyday life that you had before? So when Patrick woke up, he resolved to return to Ireland. Patrick's parents must have been devastated again. They lost their son once by force, then he miraculously returned, only to choose to leave and go back to the land of savages that took him in the first place. No one knows exactly what happened next, but to become a priest, you had to join the church. So the thinking is that Patrick did just that and spent the next few years doing what was required to accomplish that. But when his time in Ireland started is still a bit of a mystery. One likely scenario has him arriving with a contemporary bishop named Palladius, who we know arrived in Ireland as ordered by Pope Celestine in the 420s AD. Bishops weren't dispatched as missionaries so it implies that there was already some kind of Christian community in Ireland. Palladius' time in Ireland is a bit of a mixed bag, but some of that might have to do with a legacy of Patrick that would come after. Patrick had a very strong sense of mission, and while there's not a lot of details, he's said to have really pushed out into rural areas of Ireland where the pagan beliefs were the strongest, and he had a particularly affinity for slaves, himself having been one. One of the few remaining works we have from St. Patrick addresses slavery in particular. It is called Letter to the Soldiers of Coroticus. Coroticus being a sort of 5th century warlord king. In it, Patrick compares the marauding soldiers to demons. He makes an allusion to slavery being a fate worse than death, and calls on the people of the area to not welcome or eat with anyone who holds to those ideas. He continues scolding them throughout the letter, but in the end, brings it back to them still having a chance for redemption and salvation if they abandon their wicked ways. A defining characteristic of Patrick was that he did not see himself as a theologian, but as a laborer. Doing his work for others was what mattered to him. But he was well aware of where he was and who he was dealing with. Patrick was up against plenty of resistance. The Celtic culture and traditions were still very much alive and dominant in some areas. Patrick himself writes about having to do work with and around the Celts. And even if they get along at times, they would still view Patrick as a threat to their society and attempt to capture him and kill him. Patrick spread his message one tribal king at a time. If you can change the king, you can change the whole tribe, was the thinking. But it wasn't a resounding success. Some groups converted, but many did not. Celtic societies tended to have very rigid hierarchies, whereas Patrick's Christianity viewed people as equals. This would be tremendously upsetting, 
as you're now putting the lower class in the same playing field as the elite, and telling those kings that they're not really in control. In the backdrop of all this, is that Patrick probably met some resistance within the official church, too. Ireland was a place where the church hadn't really had a lot of success yet, and Patrick was not very good at Latin, which was not just the church's main language at the time, but the language of educated society. The quote-unquote academic pedigree might have held more weight than the actual ability or experience of Patrick. So, here was this relatively young man going to one of the hardest places in the world and managing to get results. This must have been offensive to some people in the upper echelons. There's more there, too. In his sort of book Confessions, Patrick says openly that he used church money to bribe Celtic kings and their sons so that he could travel across their lands to reach other tribes. Rather than using the money to build churches in towns or doing whatever else the church did in more populated areas, Patrick felt it was more important to simply spread the Gospels as far as he could. Now, if you are the by-the-book bishop elite type, how do you respond to this kind of rule-breaker? When Patrick wrote his letter to Coroticus, he also broke the rules. Coroticus wasn't from Patrick's jurisdiction as a bishop, so it was improper for him to be reaching into another bishop's domain to criticize someone in it. But the bishop that perhaps should have wasn't about to tick off the biggest warlord in the area. Is that cowardly? Maybe. I mean, what if the guy then kills or captures everyone else in response? I think that's a valid question, but the point is, Patrick didn't care about any of that. He showed some principle, for better or for worse, and not everyone liked it. Patrick would no doubt remain in that controversial space for some time, continuing to do what he felt was God's plan for him until he died. His death is a bit of a mystery. No one knows exactly how or when he died, but it is believed to have taken place sometime between 460 AD and 493 AD. So Patrick didn't convert all of Ireland to Christianity, and in some areas, Celtic traditions were virtually as strong as they were when he was alive, but he had planted seeds for the transformation of the entire island. As I mentioned in the beginning, much of the legend of St. Patrick is medieval storytelling at its finest, from over a thousand years later. In some ways, they're a testament to those seeds Patrick planted, as they grew into something larger than perhaps even he could have anticipated, and the memory of him became so powerful that it inspired people long after his death. The stories about the snakes and the shamrocks, it's all well and fun, and those stories aren't without meaning, but it's kind of a shame, because what we have in Patrick's true life story is no less dramatic. It's the story of a young man who found himself in a hard time, and afterwards set out to accomplish something in spite of his past troubles. Even in the religious context, I think his story is still chock full of similarities to other stories that are in the Bible. For example, I couldn't help but think about the conversion of Paul when reading some of Patrick's story. Paul is of course not a Christian at the time until Jesus appears to him and changes his life forever. When the voice leads Patrick to escape slavery, he also ultimately becomes a missionary. There is also the imagery of the shepherd, which is used frequently in the Bible, and Patrick is often depicted with a shepherd's crook. And of course, he was famous or infamous for wandering to the edges of what was considered the habitable world, searching for lost souls rather than hanging out at the temple. He was a bit of a rebel too, challenging the religious orders of the day, both Christian and pagan. The legends don't need to be made up to reinforce who Patrick was. So Patrick is, of course, the patron saint of Ireland, and the shamrock has become an almost universal symbol for his feast day, whether it's historically accurate or not. St. Patrick's Day became the official feast day in the Catholic Church in the 1600s. Even if you aren't a Christian, or religious at all for that matter, you'll no doubt see green clothes and shamrocks all over the place. And, on more than a few social media posts, green beer. But maybe, just maybe, you'll also think about the life of the real St. Patrick too. That's it for this episode. See you next time. The music in this episode, in order of occurrence, Fiddles McGinty, Gregorian Chant, Avengin B, Hidden Past, Moorland, by Kevin McLeod, and available at Incompetech.com.